I mean, I think the whole idea of getting a lot of people to like use chat GTP and all of this stuff is, is to lead us down this path that Kissinger and Schmidt, among others, uh, sort of are charting out for humanity. Like if you develop a skill um, and then don't do it for 10 or 15 years, for example, you kind of forget how to do it. Right. So there's this whole idea of if you don't use it, you lose it. So if people are depending on AI to tell them where to turn when they're driving their car and, you know, no one use, uses like actual maps anymore. I mean, I understand that it's convenient, right? And I'm not saying like, oh, we need mm. to go back to the 90s, but, right? But it becomes after a while a slippery slope where people are just having the computer tell them everything to do. Every step of their lives ends up becoming micromanaged to an extent. Um, and the idea is that AI, through all the data that it absorbs about us, knows so much about us. Some of these people say it knows us better than we even know ourselves. Um, you know, there's that allows for an unprecedented degree of manipulation. And the problem is, is that the people uh, producing and programming AI and ultimately controlling AI and what it can do do not have our best interests at heart. And it is not a good idea to basically hand them our brains in a bag. The dawn of AI is no longer a distant future. It's our present reality. As the World Economic Forum recently highlighted, the rise of AI necessitates the development of new skills to adapt and thrive in this era. Adding to this, a comprehensive study by the IMF indicates that AI could potentially influence up to 60% of jobs in advanced economies. This staggering figure brings to the fore the dual nature of AI. As a catalyst for innovation and as a harbinger of potential job displacement and socioeconomic shifts, Whitney Webb offers a thought-provoking perspective on how AI is redefining our skill sets and autonomy. Her observations are pivotal as we navigate an AI-driven world, from performing mundane tasks to making complex decisions. Before we begin, kindly support our channel by hitting the like button, subscribing, and activating the notification bell for more compelling content. Who owns AI, right? Uh, it's pretty much Silicon Valley company. So like even OpenAI, Sam Altman's thing, uh, that's essentially like owned by Microsoft, right? And so you mm -hmm. have what? Microsoft, Google, Amazon, uh, Oracle, all of these companies essentially owning like almost everything. Um, and all of those companies are contractors for military, the military and intelligence, right? And uh, when you consider something like Palantir, they profile people, they suck up all of your data, and then they profile you. Um, and Palantir can profile like whether or not they deem you subversive or not. And what happens when AI, you know, gets access of that and gets put in control of things like humanitarian aid, like they're talking about doing, um, or in charge of, um, you know, the government itself, which is also talked about in the Schmidt Kissinger book. It gets complicated. So, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the coming sort of like social credit paradigm, for example. So what happens if there's a big crisis, uh, your country is like a war zone or the, the economy collapses and you're dependent on humanitarian aid or some sort of aid from the government or uh, some other group and there isn't enough for everyone, right? And so they decide, oh, well, it's fair to put super intelligent AI in charge of it. And then that AI is like, oh, well, this person's been very compliant and hasn't committed all of these thought crimes, but not you. You know, who is it going to decide to give the food rations to and stuff like that? You know, that's the risk of a lot of this stuff when it gets put in charge of too many systems. And then there's another issue of whether AI is actually accurate or not. Um, so, you know, they'll say, uh, like with, with facial recognition, I think there was... um a report a few years ago in the UK that a lot of the facial recognition stuff that the the Met Police and, and other law enforcement groups are using are it, it insanely inaccurate, uh, but they want to not, they want to continue using it and like deepen its involvement in identifying people, whether it's like at live events and all sorts of stuff. Um, and I mean, it was insanely inaccurate. I mean, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was like under 50% accurate. So like flipping a coin is more accurate in that case. And what happens when AI algorithms that choose who lives and who dies, uh, you know, are put in charge of stuff and they're like 70% accurate or less? Because, I mean, the government's really corrupt with contractors. Like they don't 
always pick the best contractor for the job. So someone has connections that gets their AI in charge and they oversell they, their AI and say it's 95% accurate, but it's not audited by an independent company, right? And so it's actually like in reality, 65% accurate or something. And you're putting it in charge of like stuff that has a major effect on people's lives. That kind of stuff is happening. And it's, I mean, I'm talking about stuff that hasn't necessarily quite happened yet, but we're headed there. In this clip, we explore Whitney Webb's focus on Silicon Valley's influence over AI development. This raises significant ethical concerns and questions about privacy, bias, and the potential misuse of AI in critical sectors like law enforcement and government. The omnipresence of AI is evident across numerous industries. It streamlines healthcare by assisting in quicker, more accurate diagnoses and revolutionizes transportation with the advent of self-driving vehicles, as evidenced in recent studies. Webb's apprehensions are underlined by real-world instances where AI's accuracy and impartiality are critical, yet often challenged. The conversation around AI's role in our societal framework is intensifying. Let's continue our exploration with Whitney's take on the potential risks and evolutionary trajectory of AI integration. People need to keep in mind that a large amount of alternative media uh, gets money from what I refer to as Thielverse, um, with meaning Peter Thiel, right? Um, but really more broadly, it's the PayPal, PayPal mafia, as it's been called, people affiliated with PayPal to various degrees, which of course includes uh, Elon Musk. They have a lot of influence alter over alternative media and even over uh, content platforms like Rumble. Um, and have been funding, quote unquote, libertarian movements and all of this stuff. But I don't really see them as being libertarian at all. So like taking Peter Thiel as an example, you know, Peter Thiel claims to be uh, a Bitcoin maximalist. Right. And then he goes after he says that um, on a panel next to then CIA director Mike Pompeo and says uh, Bitcoin is a Chinese financial weapon against the U.S. dollar. Right. And then in terms of libertarianism, you know, um, Peter Thiel says he's a libertarian, but instead uh, he created Palantir, which is the most uh, insane surveillance tool that the CIA has today. So you literally handed the worst part of the state, the worst tool possible, but you're a libertarian and you're against state overreach. Um and so similarly, Elon Musk has, you have to look at the actions of Musk and then what he says. And not enough people uh, do that, whether it's for Musk or really anyone. You have to look at people's actions, not just what they say, because someone can say all the right things and then, you know, be totally f you behind your back. And if you're just going to take what they're telling you and the excuses and whatever, I mean, you'll never figure out what's actually going on. And I think that's fair for Elon Musk as well. Did he buy Twitter to save free speech or did he buy Twitter to have a mass of data uh, to train AI on and to train all other sorts of products he has on? Um, or did he make it like he's openly admitted, did he buy it so he can turn Twitter now X into X, the everything app that doesn't just become, uh, you know, a made, you know, isn't just social media. It becomes half of the financial system and becomes American WeChat which of course WeChat in China uh, mm -hmm. is a, the everything app means you have all the data. Basically, if people use it for everything, it accumulates more data than everything else. And it has all the control. There's a lot of cultural issues with celebrity in the West where people are waiting, have been trained to wait for a political savior who's going to come and save us of all of our problems. And no one actually has to do anything. And we can just, sit back and wait for the right person to run for office. And then we all vote for them. And then this one person is magically going to save us from all of our problems. A lot of people in alternative media are going to promote certain figures. I mean, maybe they're funded by them. Maybe they're not. Right. Um, but ultimately, you know, a, a lot of what keeps the current system in power is our trust in it or our, you know, like the financial system in particular. Right. You know, mm. trust is super fundamental to that, but it doesn't deserve our trust. Right. The current system. And so we need to withdraw our consent and uh, from the system and our trust in these people who have spent decades and decades and decades screwing everyone over. You know, it's time to put our trust in people who actually deserve it. And a lot of times in any one person's life, you know, the people you actually know you can trust are people, you know, at the local level. And so it, I think, you know, it's time to kind of start there. And, you know, that sort of leads into the whole idea of like decentralization also that like the more mm -hmm. power goes back 
to the local level, the less power the national or state or whatever uh, has, you know. And there needs to be a, a power shift towards the public and towards the people. And we can't just wait for the right politician to be put in charge of the state to give that to us, right? We have to do that um, ourselves because as we've historically seen, the state, whether it's capitalist or communist, uh, accumulates more money and power for itself. Whitney Webb scrutinizes the dichotomy between the public personas of tech magnates and their actual impact on media and cryptocurrency. This critique leads us into the broader ethical dimensions of AI, encompassing biases, privacy concerns, and the overarching question of accountability when AI systems falter or make unethical decisions. Webb's insights underscore the need for grassroots initiatives and personal responsibility in an era of rapid technological advancement. As AI becomes more entrenched in our daily lives, maintaining an informed and balanced view on its benefits and risks is vital. This approach is crucial to ensure that AI continues to serve humanity's best interests, rather than becoming a detriment. We hope this episode has illuminated the complex interplay between technology and societal norms. In this AI-driven era, being informed, engaged, and proactive is key. Thank you for joining Unscripted Crypto. We value your thoughts and perspectives, so please share them in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe for more thought-provoking content.